Good afternoon. Uh, this is our fourth week, the third PowerPoint lecture that I am presenting for your learning teams. And um, I have chosen to use just one portion of what I um, will be sending to you uh, to give you a live lecture or a, a tape lecture. And then there's a 14 page, uh, actually 13 page PowerPoint. Um, additional presentation called Gaining New Perspectives and Behavior, and that's for the week four class. And what I have done is I've selected uh, from that uh, slide presentation an additional PowerPoint slide that I use every time I teach this class. And I am using this because uh, we're trying to help people gain new perspectives. And sometimes it's helpful for us to also be aware of some very uh, clear, helpful skills to use with clients uh, to help them move ahead. So we're going to talk about four different kinds of questions. Now last uh, PowerPoint uh, lecture that I gave, we also talked about questions, but these are more specific questions where you are working to help find, help the client or your interviewee find a, <clears throat> a new way of looking at things by the kinds of questions that you ask. So I've entitled this uh, Positive Asset Search. It begins with a paradigm shift. A paradigm is the map we use to figure out the world around us. So we're going to be looking at how, how we look at things and how clients may look at things and help them look at things differently from a, a slightly different perspective, sometimes a, a erratically different perspectives so that they can uh, maybe break loose from some of their ways of thinking about their life and their situation so that they can be more effective in dealing with whatever it is that they've come in to talk with you about. Uh, so this little guy is representing a huge pair of glasses and as we work with people and as people uh, go through life we have a set of glasses as it were a way of looking at things and we see what we believe. So we come up with a set of beliefs as we grow up and as we uh, go through life and we, we tend to look at life that way. Sometimes we look at life in a very negative way. For whatever developmental uh, things have happened to us, we, we develop a, a way of looking at life that maybe uh, is not as um, constructive uh, as other ways might be and sometimes we have to challenge those ways of looking at life and that's kind of what we're asking uh, folks to do when we're looking helping them change behaviors and look at life in a new perspective so we have these set of glasses we look through this grid uh, <clears throat> this chain link fence as it were and and we look through this way of uh, seeing life through the glasses that we may wear uh, figuratively of course for many of you and uh, we, we see life that way and so in order for people to change, they have to very often they, they challenge the way they look at life. <clears throat> Let me talk about a paradigm. <clears throat> for years, watch, watches and clocks were made basically uh, as a, a Swiss watch with the hands, the second hand, the long hand, the short hand that moves around um, uh, the dial. And it, uh, uh, that, that was the way that we thought time was best uh, understood and, and recorded and viewed. And so for years, that paradigm was, this is the way a clock works, whether it's Big Bend in London or the, the wristwatch or whatever. Then along came a different way of looking at time. And the Japanese watch was developed and lo and behold, it was a different perspective, a different way of looking at time with little numbers that changed on our dial. And we thought, well, forever, time was done with the, the long hand, the short hand, the second hand, and numbers 1 through 12. Lo and behold, the Japanese came up with another way, a digital watch, another way of telling time. And so people began thinking of time and learning to tell time a little differently. 
And it's hard for my grandchildren, for example, to tell time, except when they use the uh, digital kind of watch. So <clears throat> it's a different paradigm, a different way of uh, thinking about how time would look. Okay, so that's just a simple example of a paradigm. So we have changed the way we look at the way time is told uh, in a day. All right, so when we do a positive asset search, uh, and we're working with a client to help them think in a positive way about the assets they bring to a, a situation to help them deal with the problem, uh, we, we have to help them, uh, we, we need to help them deal with certain um, aspects of time. And so there are certain issues uh, that are to be dealt with. Our reality and our solutions are a product of our paradigms, our perspectives, and our assumptions. We develop over time as we grow certain ways of thinking about a lot of different things. And so, so do our clients. And so when we come into a situation and they come to you with a problem, <clears throat> whether it's, you know, whatever it may be, because I don't know, of course, at this point, you don't know perhaps what kind of, of uh, interviews you're going to be doing, but the, the principle can apply to uh, all kinds of things. We come up, though, with our reality, our solution. They are a product of our paradigm. Number two, our paradigm may facilitate or limit solutions to problems. Not everybody's paradigm needs to be changed, of course. Some of our paradigms are very functional. They help us get through problems. So <clears throat> as we do an asset search, we find you know, if their paradigm is very effective in how to deal with a problem, we don't try to change that. <clears throat> and then a third thing, although we see and interpret things differently, we may both be right. There may be, as with that, the watch, the telling of time, <clears throat> there's the Swiss watch and there's the Japanese watch. There's the, the, so, so those are two paradigms. They both are 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 effective at telling us what time if we know how to use them. Okay? So, uh, although we see and interpret things differently, we may both be right, as that illustration would say. So, <clears throat> positive asset search. Asset search. Question. What does your client, your interviewee, or whatever it is your agency uh, may call if you work on an agency, what does your client do well. <clears throat> that is a very powerful uh, concept to bring when you're doing, helping people deal with problems. What do they do well? Because when we come to uh, <clears throat> working with people, very often we come with, uh, the, you know, it's a problem-oriented kind of, uh, of, of situation and they only see the problem that they're dealing with and they don't see the assets that they have to deal with the problem. So our goal when we're working with folks who are stuck, maybe in a, in a way of looking at things and their paradigm needs to be challenged, we say, what does your client do well? And so we do a search. We begin asking questions. We help them kind of identify things that they already do well and find out the strengths that they bring to any given situation. And we may, in fact, do a pencil and paper kind of thing. Have them write down or we write down with them. <clears throat> the things that they do well, the things that they bring with them when they come into your office, your, your agency, wherever it is you're working, that will help them deal with this situation. Sometimes people forget what they have that's a strength, and that's what some of these, uh, the, the questions that we're going to now uh, introduce, as these are uh, concept questions, uh, that we're going to introduce for you to think about when you're working with folks. The first one is called, uh, okay, uh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself one slide, let me go back. So, <clears throat> we're, we're going to, uh, there are some ideas uh, for the search. Expect when you work with folks to find strengths. Help them think in terms of their strengths. So that's the first thing that you want to think. Uh, so, so when you do a search with, with folks to help them change their perspective, to, to change behaviors, you look at, you come with the attitude, and you bring the attitude with you to the interview that those folks have some strength. And then learn, you learn to ask questions 
that lead to discovering the strengths that they have. <clears throat> Again, when we're in a crisis, we often forget what we do well. And so many times it's a, uh, a product of working with the folks till they can begin seeing for themselves what they do well. You may see it, but you have to help them also see what they do well. Okay, so I'm going to introduce to you four kinds of questions that you can use. And uh, the, the fourth one is uh, uh, a tricky one, and so we're going to focus more on the, the first three, but uh, the fourth one is usable in certain situations, and we'll talk about that. So the first question is a uh, type of question. is called an exception question. And here's an example of an exception question. <clears throat> when have you successfully dealt with this problem before? Even briefly, what did you do? So look at that, how that question is set up. When have you successfully <clears throat> dealt with this? So you're assuming that they have dealt with the problem at some point and they've done pretty well. Even if it's just briefly that they have dealt successfully with whatever it is that they're bringing to uh, your uh, interview. So, <clears throat> there are a couple things about this kind of question, the exception question. It implies the client's strength and ability to solve problems. So that, when you bring that, that's helping them tap in, or you're asking them to tap into that strength they have to solve problems. Secondly, focuses on tangible successes. Not something vague and generality, but you're asking them to give you a specific time and things they specifically did when they successfully dealt with the problem that they brought in. Because it's probably not the first time they've had this kind of problem. It may be the circumstances this time are a little different, but usually people have dealt with the same problems more than once. And then another thing helps the client <clears throat> to think in terms of hope. Very powerful concept. As, as we know in working with folks, if they lose hope, you know, that is a powerful thing for them to lose. If they still have hope, they, they will be able to deal with all kinds of things. So it helps the person think in terms of hope. And then lastly, <clears throat> our fourth thing, looks to rediscover forgotten resources. I alluded to this concept earlier, that people when they're under stress, sometimes forget what they can do. And so your role in many ways is helping them to remember and relive their successes. So the exception question is a powerful tool to use. And you may word it in different ways, but the same idea is that you're looking for things that they've done in dealing with this problem successfully, and what are those things. So that's the exception question. <clears throat> then there's the coping, the coping question. And again, uh, uh, just a little variation on the, on the uh, first question. This may be pain, you might say to the person, this may be painful to talk about, but how have you been able to deal with this situation? So you're acknowledging that it's painful. But you also are saying, you know, you've dealt with it to some degree already. So you have been coping some to deal with this. And, and again, you select when you use these kinds of questions. <clears throat> so the person comes in, they're having this problem. You say, you know, you seem to have been coping some, so tell us about that. So what this coping question does, it indicates to the client that you see them coping at least some, some with the situation. So again, it's, it's building that hope thing. Wow. That's a tough situation you're dealing with. How have you been able to do, deal with it so far? How have you been able to cope to this point in dealing with this problem? Acknowledge the problem and a client's current attempts to deal with the situation. <clears throat> Again, you are acknowledging or you are telling the client, I understand, it's painful, you have a problem you're dealing with, and it helps them to, to, to con, uh, make connection with the client and to be empathic with the client 
and that they are dealing with this uh, to some degree. So they're coping. And the third thing, provide a positive reframing of a difficult situation. Remember, <clears throat> again, when people are under stress, they sometimes forget how they are, are doing. And you are helping them reframe it. They will come in maybe seeing themselves as totally failing uh, in dealing with the situation. But you are going to help them, perhaps, uh, using this question, you're going to be helping them reframe it. Well, yeah, it's really tough, <clears throat> and you're struggling, and there's a lot of stress, but, you know, one of the positive things that you're doing to deal with this, because I see that you, even though it's painful, you're dealing with it to some degree. So you're begin to, beginning to help that person uh, <clears throat> discover uh, their positive assets and how they're trying to change or deal with a certain situation. A third question. <clears throat> this is the one that I have used a lot in working with uh, clients that I used to work with at the state hospital where uh, these folks maybe had uh, some uh, learning disabilities and cognitive impairments. <clears throat> and this is a very concrete way of helping folks. It's called the scaling question. <clears throat> and you say something like, on a scale of 0 to 10, sometimes you'll see it written up on a scale of 1 to 10, but I always start with 0. 0 meaning you have no power over the problem, and 10 meaning you have total power. Where would you place yourself right now? <clears throat> I used to get a, a when I work with a, a people in a, a, a group situation, I would ha often have a clipboard to keep notes on. And I had on the back of my clipboard a scale, like a ruler, that I would have on there. And I'd have this, my clipboard down this way. I'd be taking notes or reminding myself to you know, uh, talk about certain things on, depending on the group. But then I'd have on the back this scaling question. And on a 0 to 10, I'd have it. And with each, uh, between each number, I had a dot. So you'd have 0, dot, 1 dot, two, dot, three, dot, four on until you get to ten. So, <clears throat> you'd ask the person, uh, on a scale of zero to ten, where do you see yourself now in dealing with this situation? Invariably, people will pick five or somewhere, you know, close to five. Uh, and, and that's great. All, all you're doing with the scaling question is you're trying to help them look at where they're at right now and then you're going to work with them on how to move ahead very slightly. So, it helps to make an abstract situation concrete. So you're asking them, how are you dealing now with the situation? And if they say five, you say, okay, that's great. So it's not a total failure. And, you know, you, you're dealing with the problem, but it, and it's not ten where you would like to be. But, you know, you're somewhere in the middle there. So there's some success you're having, right? <clears throat> so the question becomes a, a very concrete way of helping them think about things and how they could maybe move from five to five and a half. You don't want them to move from five to six, but you work with them to move from five to five and a half. Because when you're dealing with people and change, you want to use small steps. You don't leap when you make changes. You know in your own life as you're dealing with certain learning certain skills or, or dealing with life's problems you don't make usually huge leaps. Sometimes you do but usually it's a small step to move forward. And so you say okay uh, what would be one thing you could do that would uh, but before we meet the next time that you could tell me about now that you'll practice on to be making it where you're dealing with that problem five point five and a half before next week. And they almost always can come up with something. Uh, no matter how, what their cognitive impairment may be, uh, with a little work you can almost always help them think of one small step they can take to be more successful in dealing with whatever the problem is. <clears throat> Another thing, places responsibility on the client to change. Extremely important. You're not, you're taking their idea and having them work with it. You're not suggesting to them uh, what they need to do, but you help them explore ideas, and sometimes it's in a group setting, and in a group, 
the group will often help them think about different ways of doing that. And you sit back and kind of assess how they're doing and then encourage uh, ideas that will, would really make sense for that particular client to use. So it places the responsibility on the client to make changes. Helps the client learn to think or to take small steps in getting better. And that's a, a, an amazingly important thing to help people do when they're trying to make behavioral changes. Because the big steps they will trip over and take two big steps and maybe fall on their face, uh, uh, figuratively of course. And so you help them with a small step where they'll feel successful and they can come back next time you meet with them and they can say, wow, I was able to do that. And yeah, it's not all that I like for it to be, but it's better than it was. Okay, now, the next question, the fourth question is one that you would use very selectively because it's a little tricky to present. And I usually use this with more sophisticated clients or clients that are kind of in that uh, the inner circle kind of uh, conversation that you may be having that we talked about last time <clears throat> where they built a lot of confidence in you and, and you kind of know pretty well where their abilities are to move ahead. So the miracle question is, is fairly lengthy. Suppose tonight you go to bed and while sleeping and completely unaware of it, a miracle happens. When you wake up, the problem that, you, that brought you here are the problems are solved. What would people see or what would people see you doing differently? So the emphasis is on doing differently. So they've gone to sleep, a miracle happens when they wake up, the problems are solved. How would they behave differently? Again, <clears throat> use with care. If you get a very concrete person, or a person who has some psychiatric impairments or who is, is, has intellectual disabilities or uh, learning disabilities, then this is probably a little more difficult for them to use. I've used this with some high-functioning folks that I've worked with in private practice and it has worked. I, I, I wouldn't say I've had, I've, I've had three times when it's really worked well. I don't use it very often. but. <clears throat> It is an effective way, uh, and can be, uh, if you use it well. Okay, the miracle question continues. Implies the problem is manageable. So you are saying to them by using this that there, you can do something and people will be able to see you doing it differently. Encourages the client to imagine solutions. Sorry. To, to imagine solutions, to think about so we're trying to help them get out of their way of thinking about the problem and move ahead and think in terms of, of a solution to the problem. Uh, projects the client into a time and place when the problem is manageable. So it, it, you're, you're helping them in some way by this question to get unstuck from where they're at. And a fourth thing builds hope for future success. Uh, I could take time, but, uh, and I may in class when we talk about these things, but to, to give you uh, an example of this where a high-functioning person did this and was very successful at using this and he, he really uh, broke out of his way of thinking about his work situation because of the miracle question. So it can work, you're selected with it. So those are four kinds of questions that we can use, three in particular, the first three, that can be very effective in helping people look at the strengths they have, helping them think in terms of making effective changes in their lives so that they can move ahead. So, the best act of discovery consists not in finding new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. Remember the paradigm idea that we started with. We see through, we, we see through a certain set of glasses, a, a screen, a grid, and when we work with people effectively, we're, we're helping them, hopefully, be able to look at their situation differently and uh, appreciate the fact that they are able to make uh, changes in their way of looking at life. Now, I want you to look at this week at this video, but also go through the PowerPoint, um, eight, 14 pages or so, 
that uh, I will also be placing on the forum so that uh, about 13 other pages so that you will be able to look at the notes and uh, discuss as a learning team what you uh, see in the notes and think about these things and practice them uh, in your learning team both in the in class time as well as the uh, time you have together during the week.